weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. No, oh, I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know.
cries out too deep Oh, how desperately he wants us The things of earth stand next to him Like a candle to the sun sing behold behold his holy son the lion and the lamb given to us the word became a man that my soul should know and say For the sake of all mankind, salvation is in His blood. Jesus, Messiah, the righteous died for us. It wasn't over for He.
Hallelujah. Then sings my soul how great his love is. We're going to continue worshiping through communion. So take that out and you might want to start opening it now. But as I reflected on what I might share with you this morning as we celebrate communion, this is in place of a meal. It's the bread, it's the cup. And I thought of the significance of meals in our life. Think about it. Whether we're traveling into the city to watch a big game or whether we're traveling around the world to visit a place on vacation, it's all about the food, right? On my birthday, sure I want gifts, but honestly, it's more important where we're going for dinner to celebrate, right? Think about those big moments in life. My anniversary, it's the opportunity that I get to take my wife out on a date, sit down with her, share a meal and celebrate what God has done in our lives. And that's what this is. This is a holy moment where we can celebrate something significant. In fact, this represents a significant meal in history where Jesus sat down with his disciples and broke the bread and drank from the cup. And he talked about what was about to take place. It was a significant moment that his body would be broken and that his life would be poured out for us. Yet this isn't something that we do out of religious obligation. This has significant meaning today because something significant happens as we all share in the bread and the cup today. And that is it's a reminder to us that no matter your greatest failure, no matter your continued failure, that God's got you covered. And that's why we all share in the meal together right now. And then it also is a foreshadowing of what's about to take place in the future. Because the Bible says that we will all share in communion, in a feast together to mark the beginning of eternity with him. And so let's take that piece of bread in hand and let's celebrate the significance of his life that was laid down back then that is for us today and is for our future and eternity. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much, God, that your body was broken for me, was broken for each of us, that we might live in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all eat together. And then take the cup. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that your life was poured out to cover up for my mistakes, to cover up for each man, woman, and child that's here for their mistakes, that eventually we would be able to share an eternity with you. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all drink together. We're going to continue worshiping in just a moment. But now that we've shared together in this meal, let's think about the song that my soul sings, how great is his love. Isn't that what we just celebrated? We celebrated his great love that he laid his life down for us. So let's sing together all as we continue worshiping, how great is his love.
sound as he makes our praises throw. Father, we just stand here and behold your majesty, behold your beauty, behold the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all aspects of a God that just shows love and cares for us and leads us through. God, when things don't make sense, we ask for the Holy Spirit's discernment and anointing be upon us, Lord. As we walk through those doors today, as we carried some heavy burdens on our shoulders, God, we intentionally pick that up and set it at your feet. We declare your name over whatever's going on, God, because you're bigger and you're stronger and you're greater than whatever it, it looks like right now. Father, we give it to you. We put it under the blood of Christ. It's been paid for, it's bought, it's done. The victory has been won. Father, we thank you that that's the God that we serve today, Lord. We ask that you continue to receive glory through the rest of the service and in your match, this holy name, everybody say. Amen and amen. Come on, put it together. We got something to be excited about today. Before you get comfortable, before you take a seat, I need you to reach over and give somebody a fist bump. Like two or three of them. Bless you. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Bay Church. Sounds good today. You guys sound amazing. Well, we're so happy that each and every single one of you are here with us. So if you are new, make sure you grab this welcome card. You can see it in the seat back in front of you. Go ahead and do me a favor and fill out the back side. And when service is over, you can go to our welcome kiosk in our lobby where we have a great team of people to get to know you more. And word on the street is that there's also a gift for you if you are our special guest this weekend. It's a great gift because we want to celebrate you here being with us. And speaking of celebrating Ariel, once a year we have an annual meeting where we celebrate what's been happening in and through the Bay Church. And that's happening today at 2 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. Also, we'll be selecting two, deacon, uh, two deacons. Those are our servant leaders here. In fact, you can see the images of those up for selection uh, but you will not want to miss out on our annual meeting today at 2 p.m. And remember, I said it's all about the food, right? And we will be having pie and ice cream after about an hour, hour and a half meeting. So make sure you're here today at 2. You're not going to want to miss that pie and ice cream for sure. Uh, maybe you have heard, we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. Have you heard of something called Breakaway? Breakaway. Breakaway. Some people are excited, but we pray and hope that every single one of you are excited for this summer. We're going to throw the best kids camp ever. And we want all of you to get involved. Your kids are going to get involved, of course, but you too. So go ahead and check out this video.
Breakaway 2020. It's going to be amazing. Why are we doing it? Because if we win the kids, we win the community. And here we're all about reaching the Bay Area, aren't we? And so we're going to reach them through Breakaway. We need 300 of you to sign up and be a part of the camp, as well as 50 small group leaders. Why is it that we need you to be a part of this camp? Because we are going to be serving 500 kids. They're going to be from all around our community, from some of our local adopt schools some of your next-door neighbors, and we want them to have the best experience possible, and we need a lot of adults to pull, pull that all together. We're going to be having some fun in here in the worship center. We'll be doing all kinds of crazy activities. They'll be messy. They will love it, and it's going to be a great experience right here on the Bay Church's campus. So please, please sign up today. You can sign up out in the lobby. Now, I know a lot of you are busy, but we have opportunities before during and after camp that you can participate, even if you just have a couple of hours, and I promise you, you'll want to be a part of this as we, as a one church community, try and impact our local community. So sign up for Breakaway today, and what an amazing thing we can do when we all join together. That's right. So many great things uh, we can accomplish when we choose to link arms with other people around this room. And I think of moments like that that happened last weekend. We had an incredible speaker, Holda Buntain, who was here from oh, yeah. India. And you gave, through your generosity, $24,000 to Mercy Hospital. Oh. All of the money that was given went directly to Mercy Hospital. And man, that's just one way. Guys, I don't think all of us in the room are going to be taking a trip to India anytime soon, or maybe even in our lifetime. But our investment is there, and it's incredible to see. And so we want that same thing for Breakaway, our investment to be seen and generations to come in these kids. So we're going to go ahead and transition and move into our time of giving this morning. And this is, again, another step we get to take with trusting God, honoring God through our finances with the tithe. That's right. It's amazing when we're faithful with what God's given us that God is faithful to make a huge impact all around us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, God, for the impact that we can have. God, we thank you that we don't just give to the Bay Church, but we give through the Bay Church to impact those around us, God. I pray that you would do so in Christ's name. Amen. You can give in three ways. You can drop it in the bucket as it goes around. You can text to give on the number just behind me, or you can go to the bay.church and hit the give button. God bless you as you give. How's everybody doing this weekend? It's great to see you guys this weekend. Are you ready for some encouragement? Okay, let's get at it. We are in a series these days that we are calling the Ten Contentments. And by the way, it's just not a cutie way of uh, talking about the Ten Commandments so you remember it better. It's very true because uh, we will not begin to receive the promises of God until we begin to align our lives with the principles of God. So when we align our lives with the principles of God, the promises of God will begin to happen in our lives, and we will be content. That's the idea. Now, we are on the fourth of the Ten Contentments, and we are simply calling this weekend's Bible study the day. In weekend number three, a couple weekends ago, it was the name, 
and this weekend, it is just the day. Reach for your notes if you would. You have a hard copy option. And always on Uversion online on your mobile device, you can go to Uversion and just punch in the Bay Church and our teaching notes are there. Really, when we talk about the day, we are talking about values today, ultimate values and ultimate priorities about perspective, about balance. Today is very much about balanced living. It's about stress management. It's about applying a strategy or at least understanding a strategy for how to build a happy, healthy life. When we come to this, we have arrived at one of God's very best gifts, guys. I got to tell you, the day is his gift for us as human beings created in his image. And the Jews called it, when it was first originated, simply Sabbath or Shabbat. You might know it as one day off a week. But it's not just one day off a week of more frenetic activity or even just fun activity. It's a different kind of a day. And when we invite it into our lives, it is very life-giving. And so that's what we're going to learn this weekend, because it is one day each week that we'll restore balance and beauty. Uh, As Americans these days, now think about it. Think of your work colleagues. Think of your vocational environments. Think about what it's like to live your life and be you in an average week. Have you noticed that probably easily the majority of people are very busy making a living, not so much making a life. And we do know there's a big difference between making a living and making a life. Uh, We are in a culture that is obsessed with busyness. I am busier in my life right now than I have ever been. It's just ridiculous. And no matter how hard I work, and I am pretty relentless. I can never get caught up. It kind of drives me crazy, just to be honest with you. Uh, We define ourselves by what we do. We are a generation that actually can know success without fulfillment. There's a psychological term for that. It's actually called success panic. Success panic is when you've got it all, and having it all still isn't enough. There's this nagging, gnawing inner sense that something is missing, and actually something probably is. So many of our fellow citizens worship at the altar of the twin gods of profit and pleasure. And then here's an interesting thing. We have more leisure time than any culture in history. And do you know that still is not getting it done because on all the markers for psychosomatic illness, psychosoma, mind and body, we're not a healthy group as the American community. We're more strung out, stressed out, freaked out, and uptight than most other cultures who have much less leisure time than we do. So what's missing? The day. That's why we're going to talk about the day. Today. Uh, I want to guide us along a path this morning where we learn how to build our lives around the idea of prioritizing us around kingdom and eternal values, to build lives, to design lives that are at a sustainable and balanced pace. Have you noticed that your life and my life is not a sprint, it's a marathon? We've got to understand how to create some balance some normalcy, a sustainable pace, or we are going to burn out. We're just going to be another statistic. At the very least, we're going to be frustrated and feel like some version of crash and burn. The day. Now, before we go any further, let's call a timeout and let's do what we've been doing each weekend in this series in the Ten Contentments. Let's read these beautiful life-giving principles together. They're on the screens behind, they're in your notes, and of course, we find them in Exodus chapter 20. But let's read them together. Begin. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, and remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Okay, stop, time out. We are this weekend at commandment number four. Do you remember that these first four commandments all have to do with our vertical relationship 
with God. By the way, God isn't just vertical in the sense that up there, God is spirit. He's everywhere. And in fact, if we know him, the Bible says he lives in us. We are his temple and he lives within us. But these four first uh, life-giving principles are about how to keep our relationship with the God that's created us in his image healthy, vibrant, dynamic, alive, fulfilling. And think about it. Maybe now you have a little bit better understanding of what it means to not have any alternative God seducing you away from your ultimate love for him, not drifting into idol worship, not misusing the name, and today we embrace the day. Now, these final six commandments, they're not vertical, they're horizontal. These final six commandments are how you and I care for one another, how we live together, how we treat one another. And as we read from number five through number 10, those six commandments, what a beautiful world it would be if all of God's children actually live by these. Think about it. I think that if the whole planet imagined this, all eight billion plus of us, imagine if we all abided these and, and invited these life-giving principles in our lives for even a month, it would shut down social media. It would shut down the internet. It would shut down so much of the relentless white noise, yak, yak, yak chatter because there's so much more happiness and beauty in the world. But anyhow, let's read them together. Pick up the trail at number five. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. When there are things we shall not do or should not do, that means that there are built-in things that we should do. So, for example, the one about not committing adultery, the idea is have a really fulfilling, happy marriage. And so we're going to frame them in that capacity. Now, let's look specifically at our uh, fourth commandment or contentment, the day. Check it out with me. It's there in verses 8, 9, 10, 11 of Exodus 20. Let's read this one together. Are you ready? Begin. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, don't worry about what the word Sabbath means. I'll explain it momentarily. But I do want to point out, look at that second to the last sentence up there. It says, but he rested on the seventh day. He did not rest because he was tired. He rested because he was done. And he paused after six days of magnificent, brilliant creation, and he looked back on what he had done over these last six days, and he said three words, it is good. And that's one of the things that this one day a week provides for us. Like God, we can stop, call time out, and look back on the last six days of our creative effort, which is to say how we lived the last six days of our life. So it's kind of a weekly holy pause, as it were. Okay, more on that a little bit later. Now, we're going to only talk about three simple things this morning. First of all, the design of the day, then the distractions of the day, then the priorities of the day. Fill it in. Let's talk about the design of the day. Remember I told you what the word Sabbath means, and here it is. The word Sabbath, uh, or Shabbat in Hebrew, literally means rest. Isn't that beautiful? Rest. It means to cease activity. Some of you may be thinking, no, wait a minute, time out. Uh, don't the Jewish people celebrate Shabbat or the Sabbath on Saturday? Yes, they do. So if you went to Israel today, and by the way, Carrie and I are taking 60 people from this church in two weeks' time uh, to the Holy Land, to Israel, it's going to be awesome. We're already sort of networking our coronavirus options, so pray for us. We're, uh, we're feeling very good, actually, uh, although it's, uh, in some places of the world, very deeply felt. If you went to Israel on a Saturday, you would find that the country shuts down. I mean, even the elevators in the hotels. 
uh, which means that the people are very busy in the day or two before Sabbath every week uh, on that Saturday getting ready because they're not going out to the store. They're definitely not going to work. You can drive through sections of the ultra-Orthodox community in Jerusalem, and if you're driving past their houses, they'll come out with hammers and shovels and that kind of stuff and shut you down because you're doing work on the Holy Shabbat. Okay, actually, and I say with respect, that's not what God intended. This is not about rigid, legalistic, religious law. This is about life-giving principle because man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for mankind. Why? Because we need it. Because we need it. So, it means to rest, it means to cease activity, whereas it began on Saturday, Christians celebrate Sabbath on Sunday. Why is that? Because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. He was crucified on Friday, he was raised back to life by the power of God the Father on Sunday morning, which we know is Easter, it's called the resurrection, and so believers, billions of believers for the last 2,000 years have celebrated Sunday as that one day of rest. Now, what does that mean for us in the Bay? Because if I had you raise your hands now, a lot of you have to work on Sunday. You've got obligations vocationally. It's how you provide for your family and yourself. And so it's the world we live in. Listen, the issue is not so much which day. The issue is that once a week there is a day that you take to abide the principles that we're going to unpack in this fourth contentment this morning. So for Carrie and I, we don't do Saturday or Sunday. We can't. It's probably our busiest days of the week, right? So we do Friday. And on sundown on Thursday, and we've done this for almost 40 years, we, because that's when the Jews began Sabbath biblically, on sundown we begin to shut our lives down, we light candles, we have a beautiful meal together, and we begin to calm our spirits from the frenzied activity of the six previous days we've just lived. In being honest, I think I've mentioned to you also, this is one of the hardest biblical principles I've had to try to learn. I come from a bad, way, whacked out, multi-generational history of workaholics. Some of you are with me in that. And the idea of wasting a good day of work and not making money and making gain in your vocation and making progress is insanity. It was a curveball for me to begin to learn the life-giving principles of the day. Now, I want you to write down a few key words. Here's the first one. Write down the word liberates because the Sabbath is a day that liberates. God created this one day each week to be a special time, everybody, to call our attention away from earth and unto heaven, away from mankind and unto God. God intended it for it to be a day of rest and refreshing and worship. And here's the amazing built-in promise to the Sabbath. The Bible teaches that the man or woman who makes time for God and for their own soul care on a weekly Sabbath will have enough time for everything else in life that needs their attention. You say, John, I don't believe that. I know that, and that's why you're afraid to begin practicing the Sabbath principle of one day off a week. Because you're saying, I'm not getting it done now with seven frenzied days a week. How could I possibly get it done with one less day a week, okay? Let's call time out on the Sabbath for a minute. Let's talk about tithe, same exact principle. People say, I'm not able to meet my needs or what I understand my needs to be with 100% of my money. How could I do that with 90% of my money? Now, you're looking at a fairly logical, at least reasonably informed guy who observes and practices both these life-giving principles in my life. So here's my answer. How does that work? Here's my answer. I don't know, but God knows. The principle for Sabbath is the same principle for tithe. Do you trust the Lord? That's it. Because if we trusted the Lord, we would believe we could structure our lives in such capacity that the things we're doing are really important, that some of the good things actually had to be set aside so the remaining good and especially the best could all be tended to and that we trust God to give us enough time to get everything done well. 
It's the same with finance as I just alluded a moment ago. Sabbath principle, as in tithing, is the principle of do I trust my father? I'm going to tell you as a little bit more veteran than you may be down this journey, you can trust him. He's never failed me yet. This old guy has never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. And I did not grow up in a spiritual home of any kind. I'm simply telling you, God keeps his promises. And when we obey his principles, we invite his promises to visit our lives. So it liberates, and I want you to remember that. Secondly, write down this word, the Sabbath balances. The Sabbath balances. It teaches us a balance of work and play and rest and worship. Because what God is saying to us, he's saying, my child, come apart with me and rest and refresh yourself, or my child, you will simply come apart. If we're listening, we can hear him whisper from Psalm 46.1, be still and know that I am the Lord. Be still. Trust me. Chill. Rest in me. I am the Lord. The day. Shabbat. That's the design of the day. So the Sabbath was made for mankind. Why was it made for mankind? Because we human beings need it. This is not legalism. This is not religious duty. It is God's gift for tired, troubled, tempted souls. It is his liberating principle for people under pressure. It's that one day a week in which we send down life's roots deep into the fruitful soil of eternal value. That's what the day allows So the key life principle for the design is this. God is saying, keep me first in your life by refreshing your soul and our relationship with one day each week of rest and worship. So I've had you write down the principle of liberates, the Sabbath liberates. Secondly, the Sabbath balances. Write down one more word. The Sabbath is soul care. Ultimately, The Sabbath allows you the prerogative with God's empowering presence in your life to begin to nourish your own soul in him. We are very good at many things, you and I, whether it's physical fitness, whether it's our vocation, whether it's our parenting, whether it's some recreational pursuit we really enjoy, but often we really neglect the spiritual side of our lives. You and I are spiritual beings. The Bible describes these bodies of ours only as our temporary residence, even like a tent, and we are one day going to vacate this tent, which I think is probably a pretty good idea, because by the time that happens, age and gravity have caught up with all of us, right? So while outwardly we're wasting away, the Bible says, inwardly we should be being renewed day by day. Why? Because we're nourishing ourselves in God's presence with soul care, the day. Okay, so that's the design. Let's go quickly and talk about distractions of the day. I don't need to enumerate the distractions. We all know the frantic, frenzied craziness that's pulling at us all time. The temptation for us on this one day in seven each week is that we secularize it or we make it like any other day of the week. God says, no, no, make this one day the twin pillars. God says, in that one day that you rest, Make it your relationship with me, says the Lord, and also the health of your own soul. And have some fun. Do enjoying things, things that you enjoy. Celebrate life. Have a picnic. Have a backyard barbecue. Go swimming. Walk your dogs. Climb the mountains. Go to the beach. Go to, you know, all the kinds of things that we enjoy so much, but don't only do those fun recreational things. Make sure in that day you're making time for God and for your own soul care. So the distractions of the day. Let me give you an example of why this is important. If I said the word the Philistines, some of you will know who those people are. Some of you will not. They were actually a Phoenician peoples. 
they were along the Mediterranean coast of what we know today as Palestine or the nation of Israel. And they were a people back in biblical era that were a constant burr in the saddle of the nation of Israel. I mean, if there was one nation that was going to seduce, entice, undermine, or vanquish Israel in warfare, it was always those pesky Philistines. When the Philistines would conquer the Israelites in one of their frequent regional battles, they would do two things. You say, is there going to be a point here at some point? Yes, there's always a point. Sometimes it takes me a little longer to get there, but we're almost arriving. When the Philistines uh, vanquished the Israelites in battle, they'd do two things. First of all, they would deport them. They would take them away from their homes. When we're away from our homes, you know what we lose? We lose our bearing. We lose our sense of connection. We lose our sense of belonging. We lose our roots. And we see that these deportations were a frequent part of ancient warfare because it's easier to make a people you vanquished in war your captive, they're more controllable, and they're more vulnerable if they're not in their own house, as it were. Do you know what our house is, our spiritual homeland, as it were? You're sitting in it right now, the church. And I don't mean a building, I mean us as community. The church is not a building, the church is people. It's you and me. And when you, are, are, when you allow Satan, the enemy, or the trivial distractions of this temper age to seduce you away from your spiritual house, you and I are made much more vulnerable. The second thing the Philistines would do when they vanquished Israel in battle, it was they would take all their weapons from them. Now, they didn't have Bradley armored vehicles and M1A1 tanks and all that kind of stuff, but they would take their bows and arrows, their spears, their lances, their rocks, whatever, take all that away from them because not only are the people now deported and vulnerable because they're not home anymore, they don't have the strength and support and safety of home, but now they have nothing to fight with. Do you know what our main offensive weapon is as a people of faith? The Bible's very clear. Itself, the word of God. The Bible says that it is sharper than any double-edged sword. And this is our offensive weapon. Not that we are offensive with it, but this is the word of God, the promises of God, the principles of God, the truth of God that strengthens us, fortifies our soul. It's the way that we do spiritual warfare, as it were. Don't let yourself be enticed away from your spiritual homeland, the church. Don't let yourself be enticed away from the centrality of the book of God in your life, or you'll be very vulnerable indeed. The distractions of our lives, the distractions of the day. Parents, I have an encouragement for you, and here's the main thing I want to say. Your example isn't something or one thing in your children's life. It is everything. Now, I don't want to discourage you because I like to encourage you so I'm just going to be real. You can call this whatever you want. Your kids are going to grow up and be shockingly just like you. Don't blame them. What else could they be? And by the way, kids that grow up and say, I hate my parents. I'll never want to be like my mother, never want to be like my father. They so react and go to the other polar extreme of the spectrum. They're just as bad only on the other side. And by the way, they'll still end up acting and look just like her or him anyhow. The issue is to not try to not be like our parents. It's to try to become like Christ. Do you see the, what a transformational approach difference that is? So, parents, fact. If both mom and dad regularly attend church, and I know we have a, have a lot of single parents in the house, but if both, both mom and dad regularly attend church, 72% of their kids are going to grow up and their spiritual house church is going to be a big part of their life, as will their relationship with God. Parents nurture a positive attitude about the day. Make it fun. How have we forgotten to have fun and joy and creativity and silly craziness? What's happened? Why have we gotten so cheerless and joyless and grim in our lives? Well, I can suggest one of the reasons. We're not building the day into our lives. That's why. And it's push, 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 go, 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 drive, 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 drive. Accomplish, 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 accomplish. Parents, 
Rear your children in the way that they're to go. And go there yourself once in a while. In fact, go there yourself very often. Our, our behavior that we set before our children speaks so loudly they almost can't hear what we're saying. Don't worry that your children aren't listening to you. Worry that they're watching you. So you're saying, John, I'm not really that pleased with some of the ways that I intuitively live out my life in my home as a parent or mom or dad. So here's the best thing I could say to you. Change. Change. And any change, any life adjustment is possible with God's help. With the promise of Scripture now, you almost also may need some professional help. There is a place for life coaches, Christian psychologists, and spiritual caregivers, that kind of a thing. Sometimes we need that. In fact, there are times we all need that. But don't hunker down and say, I'm this way. I cannot change. Get off my back. My father was this way. His father was this way. My great-grandfather was this way. Hey, they may have been that way. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it good. That doesn't mean it was healthy. At what point are we going to say, courageously, enough is enough? We're going to do things a little bit differently in this generation. Now, our lives ultimately become, everybody, the result of our embedded behaviors. Would you agree? So this is the narrative of all one of the most important attributes of our life, giving a self-description. See if you know who this is. I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or your heaviest burden. Half the tasks you do, you might as well turn over to me and I'll be able to help you do them very quickly and quite correctly. I'm very easily managed you only have to be firm with me. Show me exactly what you want, how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I'll do it automatically. I'm the servant of all great people and, alas, of all failures as well. For those who are great, I have made great. And those who are failures, I have made failures. So take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will work at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? I am habit. I am habit. Take a step back on this day as we talk about the day and say, what embedded behaviors did I only intend as short-term options that have now grooved very deep ruts of constancy in my life? And I can see they're very counterproductive. I can see it's not helping me, and it's definitely not helping the people I care about most. What courageous people do, not perfect people, but courageous people, they say, enough is enough. I'm going to begin to replace these unhealthy habits with healthy habits. And friends, to have this kind of reflective thinking that will bring understanding and life to your life, You've got to have some time to think about it, to reflect, to do internal inventory, to seek help from the Spirit of God. The day will provide you all those things. Let's wrap up this morning and talk about priorities of the day. There's only two. We've alluded to them in various ways through our Bible study this morning. The first is rest. Now, do you know the word recreating? You can also pronounce it re creating, like renewing a creation. But this is actually rest. It's actually the soft E, recreating. And it comes from the word leisure, which is a Latin word. Do you know what the word uh, leisure means in Latin? It means permission. It means to give yourself permission to break the grip of stress and guilt and driven work by learning to rest. I mean, I think I hear the Father speaking to us between the lines in this fourth contentment, and I say, think he's saying something to you and I like, hey, kid, you know how much I love you, right? Oh, yeah, Abba, I know. Okay, so kid, knowing that, I want to say this to you in love. Knock it off. Let it be. Stop taking yourself so seriously. You are killing yourself. 
You are definitely no fun to live with anymore. There will always be more work to do. You will never be completely done. I've got your back. Invite Shabbat into your life, Sabbath rest, one day in seven. Be done and look back at the last six days of how you lived, just as I did in the early chapters of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, so that you can learn to live a life of such quality that you can pronounce on your last six days like I pronounced on my last six days, that it is good. Wouldn't that be a great way to live? but it's not going to happen by magic. We can't abracadabra this. We need to change some rutted behavioral patterns and begin to say enough is enough. I'm going to begin to build health and balance and a spiritual foundation in my life. The day is a big part of getting me there. So rest is the first component, everybody. Think about Jesus. Jesus didn't do the same thing every place. He lived in an incredibly perfectly ordered life in tune with the Father's agenda. You say, John, what if I don't do this? What if I don't have a weekly Sabbath in which I rest? Here's what I'm going to say will probably happen, not always, and I definitely don't even want this to happen. But here's what usually does happen. I've been watching people's lives, including my own, these decades. First of all, the bills will come due. And I do not mean financial bills. I mean emotional bills, psychological bills, relational bills, stress-related bills. Things will begin to break down. We will begin to come apart at the seams. Again, God says, come apart and be with me one day a week or you, my child, will simply come apart. Now, interesting distinction. There's a guy named Gordon McDonald, and in his book, Ordering Your Private World, he he says, and I quote, there is a big difference between rest, which is what we're talking about now where you're looking at the last six days of how you've lived, renewing yourself in God, soul care, and so forth, and leisure, which is golf, camping, skiing, biking, all those sorts of activities, which are good, by the way. The thing is, leisure relaxes only the body, sometimes. Restful worship renews the soul. And he concludes with these words, and that's why a vacation without rest for your soul is a waste. Now, when I was a young dad with four little kids, uh, all of a sudden, the vacation phenomena kind of hit me because we'd planned this vacation, save for the vacation, organize schedule schools, do your homework, kid, we got to get ahead, work ahead at work, et cetera, et cetera. And we'd go on this vacation, and here's what I started noticing consistently. We came back definitely not rested and relaxed. We were stressed. We were edgy with each other. We were definitely poorer had a lot less money. Now we have to tighten our belt for three three months or so to catch up for the extra money we spent. Everybody needs vacations. So if we're going to go away on these vacations and come back not liking each other and uptight, stressed out, freaked out, and poor, I said to my wife, hey, honey, something's not working here. I got an idea. Let's just not do vacations anymore. We'll be more relaxed. Our work will be caught up. We'll have more money. What do you think? What do you think how that went? Yeah, we didn't do that. (laughs) Do you see what I'm saying? So I said, there's got to be a different way. And all of a sudden, this dull man one day woke up to the idea, the reason I'm not enjoying my vacations is there's no restful time to recreate in that moment and connect with God and connect with the spiritual side of my life. So we began to say, when Carrie and I discovered this together, okay, kids, we're going on a two-weeker, right? So three days a week for four hours a day, this is what you kids are doing. And kids, I love you, but this is not a democracy. We are not voting about this. This is your very safe attitude. Mom and I are going to do, well, what are you and mom going to do? Maybe we want to come. None of your business and no, you ain't coming. Okay? So all of a sudden, we begin to have the kind of time restfully in this vacation that was nourishing us. And... uh, It it was the missing piece. Please remember, you and I are body, 
soul, and spirit. We are not just biological organisms. Our culture would have you believe that. We are spiritual beings housed in a temporary tent that one day we shall vacate. So, inner inventory, because the unexamined life is hardly worth living. Rest and recreate because it's the ultimate statement that the day reaffirms that this world does not own us, that you and I are made for rest and worship just as surely as we're made for ambition. It reminds us that no matter what pace we're living life, whether we burn out or whether we rust out, either way we're out, there's got to be some sanity some symmetry, some balance, some rhythm internally and externally. Rest is the first priority. There's a second and final priority. Fill it in, would you? Worship. So if rest is recreating, worship is recreating. And worship is renewing or recreating our soul as we encounter and endure the God who created you. It's entering into his presence that we are changed, that we're restored. And don't think you have to be down in the front of a church praying. That's a beautiful thing, by the way. But God doesn't just live here in the house. He is the Lord. And the heavens are his throne. The earth is nothing more than a footstool. I have my best God times with Shabbat with my device in my pocket. So I've only got about 300 Bibles and long walks through the woods, through the fields, through the neighborhoods, through the whatever. Just reflecting, just thinking, just giving thanks, just listening. See, when we are in his presence, we are changed. Here's my question. When does God have a chance, or when do you regularly give God a chance to look into your heart? to look into your soul. As Americans, as people of the Bay Area, we are so busy, God would have to be very quick looking because we don't stand still long enough. We're just so frenzied and stressed and worried and a little obsessed. I love this African proverb. It goes this way. I have been going too hard and too fast And I must let my soul catch up with my body. I have been going too hard and too fast. I must let my soul catch up with my body that I might be restored in the presence of God. To hear him whisper to me yet again, be still and know that I to hear him whisper those words. Now, one caution. The pathway to a weekly renewing Sabbath day is going to be a contested path. It's not going to be a piece of cake. If it was a piece of cake, you and I would both have been doing it well already for many, many years. There's the press of real life, the press of people we love and care about and live with, all the obligations of life, all the things that are breaking down, need time, attention, repair, homework needs to be done, whatever. So I'm, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to be stubborn. There are times it's going to be difficult, but we need to make a decision, order our lives around that decision, and in time, and much sooner than you think, you and I will begin to reap the dividends of aligning our lives with his truth because the enemy knows that this path to Sabbath will lead us to a place of rest, righteous living, perspective, restoring of our priorities, and renewing of our soul. And that would be the last thing that he would want. Let's wrap with this Isaiah verse. Do you see Isaiah chapter 58 verses 13 and 14? Let me read it. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, 
And if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so I say to you one and all, my dear friends, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. So the greeting in the land of Israel today, the greeting for the Christian church through the ages is Shabbat Shalom, which is to say to somebody else on the day of their, in each week in their lives, it's to say to them, peaceful Sabbath to you. Peaceful Sabbath to you. Shabbat Shalom, in which we experience true contentment of the balanced life in God. Shabbat Shalom. Let's pray. If you would like prayer to begin your Sabbath day this upcoming week, it is Sunday, the first day of the week, Resurrection Day. Some of you can take Sunday as a Sabbath. Some of you cannot. But if you say, John, would you pray for me? Because this week, I'm going to begin this new permanent fixture, this spiritual habit in my life. I need God's help. If, if that's where your heart's at, raise your hand up all over the house. Yes, 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 yes. Raise them up and keep them up. Raise them up and keep them up. All over the house. Raise them up and keep them up. Raise them up and keep them up. Anybody else? So, Father, you see the many hands in the house today as we gather as community. I love to be with these people in a setting like this. I feel so helped and strengthened and encouraged just by being with them. And I think you feel that by us being with you. For these raised hands now, and maybe others who are a bit too timid to respond, would you help these beautiful men and women as they take a step of faith to align their lives with your transcendent truth. I pray, God, that the liberating power of the day begins to set them free in all the right ways, in all the good ways, in all the life-giving ways, in all the liberating ways, in all the balancing ways, in all the ways of true spiritual soul care in your presence, O oh God. May Sabbath become a reality in every life, every home, every individual, and every family at the Bay Church in Jesus' name. And everyone said, stand to your feet, everybody, would you please? Hold tight with me for just a moment. I want to say to you that if you need a place to pray or talk, we have connect areas on both sides. And we will stay and wait for you as long as you need because we are here for you, I promise you. Secondly, um, Breakaway, the children really need us. Carrie and I are, have already signed up to volunteer on that uh, week in July, and I hope that you'll do the same. You say, John, what's at stake? Oh, only little boys and girls. Do you know how many thousands of little boys and girls in Contra Costa County in the East Bay don't have moms and dads like you and me. Being a parent, being a loving human being is much more than biologically reproducing. It's about being a loving human being in the most vulnerable life of all, a child's life. And so I would urge you to adjust your schedule accordingly. Breakaway is going to become a new big thing at the Bay Church, I promise you. And it begins this July. You can register out in the lobby, okay? Only other thing uh, I will say is, uh, for those of you that are members, we're going to have a brief uh, membership meeting today at 1 o'clock, or excuse me, 2 o'clock, and uh, we'll wrap it up with some pie and ice cream. So look forward to seeing you today. And to all of you, I love you, and Shabbat Shalom. Peace.